Gold has been anywhere from 60 to 120, 30 dollars higher in Shanghai than it has been in the US. And they're slowly turning up the heat. They don't want to do it too fast because if they do too fast, they'll cut off their nose to spite their face. They will awaken the masses. But when on 1227, when you see 2650 close on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and 2431 on the CME, something's going on. We will see a changing of the guard and a transitioning from the Western price setting mechanisms to something like the Shanghai Exchange or the exchange in Dubai or, or wherever it is in these countries that have a much stronger interest and understanding of, of what these commodities represent. In the latest data reported on January 2nd, 2024, the China Shanghai Gold Benchmark Price on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, SHPE, reached 482.370 renminbi per gram, indicating an increase from the previous figure of 480.930 renminbi per gram recorded on December 29, 2023. According to Andy Schechtman, the CEO of Miles Franklin, there has been a consistent disparity in gold prices between Shanghai and the United States. He foresees a potential shift in the primary influence on gold prices, suggesting a move away from Western mechanisms towards exchanges like Shanghai or Dubai. Schechtman asserts the active involvement of the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, in the gold market. The BIS, which reclassified gold as Tier 1, holds significance in shaping the market dynamics. Regarding gold swaps, data indicates that trading in gold swaps by the BIS continued in November. After reaching a peak of 188 tons on May 31, 2023, BIS gold swaps had dropped to zero by December 31, 2022. While there is no recent evidence to alter the assumption that the BIS engages in these swaps on behalf of the U.S. Federal Reserve, it's noted that other major central banks do not appear to be actively trading such significant amounts of gold. Instead, in 2023, several central banks have been observed accumulating physical gold. Schechtman highlights that the International Monetary Fund acknowledges the value of gold, departing from the notion of it being a relic. IMF head Kristalina Georgieva suggests that central bank digital currencies should be anchored to something substantial, potentially alluding to gold. The IMF, holding approximately 90.5 million ounces, 2,814.1 metric tons, of gold at designated depositories, solidifies its recognition of gold's significance. Just before you watch Andy Sheckman's interview, make sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a big thumbs up. BIS is involved, and it's something that I will admit that I need to polish up more on. The concept of BIS gold swaps, where they are, are using gold, they're intervening in the market, and I, I don't understand it as well as I should. Uh, there was an interview that was just done, I want to say, on Arcadia Economics by the guy who writes about all of these for GATA. It's something that's on my docket to listen to and read. But uh, unequivocally, 100%, the BIS is involved with the gold market. Look, they're the ones that reclassified it tier one. And I think what they are doing is you're seeing a global repositioning. If you look at the, the positioning of all the European banks, it's uncanny how much all of them have very close to the same in terms of their assets related to their GDP, uh, gold assets related to GDP. And you know, I think there there is no question that gold will be center stage. Even the IMF is involved in gold now, you know, calling it a, an asset that is is no longer a barbarous relic. And and uh, um, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, saying that all CBDCs need to be pegged to something. I think she's referring to gold. The BIS is involved in, in holding down the price. There's no question. And it has to do with gold swaps. So maybe the next time we have one of these, I'll polish up on it and, and be able to Jake is one of my favorite to be able to answer that question uh, with a little bit more uh, authority. But to say, indeed, they are involved with and through swapping mechanisms with, with other countries and other currencies, they are definitely involved, I think, in holding down the price, especially when you see it really take off. You'll see them come in and, and dump gold onto the market through these swaps, and you'll it has an immediate effect. I think that's exactly what would happen if I had to guess um, uh, last month when gold shot up to 2100 and change in Asia and very quickly came down. There is a concerted effort by, by the Western elite to, I think, mitigate gold's rise, at least for now. And um, they're certainly part of the game. At some point, the realization that the market is more powerful than, than the Federal Reserve may come into focus. I see 
higher inflation, it's here to stay. I see higher interest rates ultimately. And just as bullish and remarkable the equity markets, the bond market, the real estate market have been in this falling interest rate environment, which has created massive distortions in asset prices when you suppress interest rates and throw money at 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 at, a, at at the marketplace in copious amounts, you get distortions in asset prices that I think will come into some form of symmetry with higher interest rates. So I think that we will see challenges in traditional forms of investment. That's number one. I, I just think it won't be as easy as it was for money managers to pick winners. Uh, far more difficult in an environment that we find ourselves heading into. And also, it's a very interesting comment that Xi Jinping, uh, or actually it wasn't Xi Jinping who made it, it was the head of, of the, um, it was the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia talking about Saudi Arabia after the meeting with Xi Jinping. And he said, you know, the United States has been our, our most um, important trading partner for the last 50 years. But today, China is our most important trading partner in, in the area of oil and in other things. And they will be for the next 50 years. And I think there was no coincidence in, in his use of verbiage. He actually said of the next 50 years. And well, you throw that into the mix of them now formally being admitted into BRICS as of uh, January 1st. I believe that. So a situation of question marks surrounding the, the future of the petrodollar and what that means. We've talked about that a lot. And also an environment of higher interest rates, what that means and inflation, what that means for traditional investments and and their performance. Um, I think both of these things to me will will be fairly in focus as we move on uh, through 2024. Iran and Russia recently reached a significant agreement set to be officially signed in the first quarter of 2024, wherein they will conduct trade using their local currencies instead of the U.S. dollar. This development follows a meeting between the central bank governors of both nations in the final week of December 2023. Andy Schechtman notes that these countries explicitly state their commitment to trade energy in their respective local currencies, a trend gaining momentum. This shift is observed with Iran, Russia, and the United Arab Emirates, which have expressed a similar preference for using dollars in their oil transactions. In another noteworthy move, Saudi Arabia, as reported on State TV, has officially joined the BRICS bloc. Prince Faisal bin Farhan emphasizes the significance of BRICS as a beneficial channel for strengthening economic cooperation. The upcoming BRICS summit scheduled for October 2024 in the Kazan region of Russia is expected to involve around 25 new countries in the bloc. Schechtman highlights the growing prominence of this shift in currency preference and its potential to play a central role in future global events. He underscores the importance of patience acknowledging that changes related to domestic issues or the gradual decline of the U.S. dollar's dominance are ongoing processes. Let's get back to the interview. We are seeing pushback from that. I mean, you got Iran and Russia. Obviously, I'm choosing two countries that are being sanctioned by the West right now, but have formally said we're only going to trade in local currencies instead of U.S. dollars for energy. This is a trend that we are beginning to see more and more and more and more. Obviously, we talked about uh, the United Arab Emirates making that statement as well, that they want to only accept dollars for their oil moving forward. But this is something that we're continuing to see. And I think it will it will be very, very front and center as we continue down this progression of events. I think we will see more countries uh, joining together uh, in the BRICS and, and, and a coalition of other groupings. For example, the Eurasian Economic Union and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I believe, will join BRICS formally. Uh, the head of Bel uh, the president of Belarus is calling for this to happen, calling for a summit for it to be put into place. Mm -hmm. You know, look, there's no coincidence when you've seen the span of one year, Iran join the, U uh, join the um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS. And so when you talk about new relationships being built, largely based upon commodities and or strategic transportation routes, I mean, look at, at the Red Sea and the Straits of Hormuz, what's going on there now? Well, that falls right into the hands of, 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 of Russia and BRICS and their Northwest, Northwest Corridor and, the, and these new shipping lanes that where they don't have to worry about the U.S. Navy, where, where it will be a permission-based alternative where you can get to where you're going instead of going around the Cape, I think, the Cape of Good Hope, I think it's called. It would take almost two weeks longer to do that. So all of these 
things are are being put together strategically. You look at the 20 com- countries that have formally applied to the BRICS, 20, uh, and they're all rich in natural resources or strategic areas of transport. And then there's another 20 countries we're not even quite sure about who have informally expressed interest. So I think it will be continuing of the same, of these relationships being built, of finding critical mass or mass adoption. And really, I think it's important for people to temper their expectations of instant gratification. It's a, it's a problem where people, oh, they didn't issue the, the central bank uh, or they didn't issue the common settlement currency for the BRICS. It's a nothing burger. No, it's not. They're doing things in a very, very thought out methodical fashion. And I think that's what we will continue to see. And that's why I'm so fond of the phrase logarithmic decay, little by little by little by little. We continue to see this little by little by little by little happening all around us, whether it be here at home or with the continuing de-dollarization. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that. I think people just want to know when is that all at once moment? And I don't know when the all at once moment is. I, I you know, I, there are no absolutes. There are probabilities. And I think the probability grows by the day. Look, we can just look out seven years and say that by 2031, which is probably a mass understatement, uh, gross understatement, the U.S. government, um, it's been a long day. I've done four podcasts. I forgot the branch of the government that said this, but they came out and they said, look, by 2031, 100% of all tax revenue will go just to pay the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlements like Social Security, which is already $70 trillion in, in the whole. Trillion seconds ago, you guys, 31,688 years ago, the jig is up, right? But that means how do we ever suspect or or, or hope to maintain our status uh, as the most dominant military and superpower financially in the world when 100% of all the discretionary, uh, um, uh, what am I trying to say? The all discretionary, our tax revenues, yeah. uh, pardon me? All of our tax revenues. Yeah, well, no, just... the disc- all this discretionary spending, 100% right. of it, will yeah. have to be borrowed, and that includes military. How might the observed disparity in gold prices between Shanghai and the United States impact the future dynamics of the gold market, especially considering the potential shift away from Western mechanisms? Considering the growing trend of countries expressing commitment to trade in local currencies and the potential induction of new countries into the BRICS bloc, what role could gold play in facilitating international trade agreements and alliances in the foreseeable future? Share your thoughts in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Surprisingly, around 19.8% of our viewers have subscribed. We aim to reach 5,000 subscribers as soon as possible, and your support could make a big difference. Thank you for being a part of our community.